At a time, folks, when USC football is as intriguing, exciting, and creating as much attention as it has in years and years and years, we thought, hey, this is a great time to start a very exciting, what we hope to be, USC football show for you each and every week. So right now it's Tuesdays, 4 Eastern, 1 p.m. where it counts there on the West Coast uh, here at the Voice of College Football. And the only way we can make this really work, make it happen, is this guy who really has um, made our USC channel uh, something of note here. We appreciate Matt Zemek from Trojans Wire. Matt, how you doing today? Doing great. It's always a great time to talk USC football now that we're in the Lincoln-Riley era. We have Clay, Clay Helton in the rearview mirror. You, know, you rightly said USC is as intriguing as it's been in years after being as unintriguing and uninteresting as it was in 2021. So a 180 degree shift, we couldn't be happier. So many of you are joining us and understand what we do here at the Voice of College Football. We've got eight other team-specific live streams that we do throughout the week. So leave those comments and questions there in the live chat. And if you're new uh, to this format, leave those comments and questions there in the live chat. We will get to as many as possible. We would love to do this as long as it's viable and makes sense. So please keep in mind uh, your contributions count here on the, on the Super Chat. And also, um, if you own a small business, would love to sponsor us here at the Voice of College Football USC, hit me up at MarkRogersTV at Gmail and uh, or uh, are in contact with anyone who owns a small business and we can outline how we can benefit you. All right. We're going to talk up the Trojans as we will each and every week. Again, four Eastern, one Pacific time. All right, Matt. There are some rumblings out there just concerning some, some transfers here and there. We will get to those in a second, but let's go to that, that star that's uh, possibly coming via Pittsburgh, Jordan Addison, in the most ballyhooed of the transfer portal situations, not just because of his playing ability, but because of the circumstances surrounding his entry into the transfer portal. A lot of speculation even before he entered the portal. Pat Narduzzi's... Um, whining, griping, concern, however you want to phrase that. Um, where do you think we stand on Jordan Anderson? And do you do you anticipate any kind of timetable here? Yeah, I don't have a strong feel for where we stand. And, and let's keep in mind that, you know, I thought that, you know, on the recruiting trail, Josh Connerly was signed, sealed, and delivered to USC. Like I was anticipating that didn't happen. So many abrupt, jarring plot twists in this offseason. And, of course, an offseason which began at USC the day after um, the, the BYU game uh, in late November when Lincoln Riley was hired. We all remember Bruce Feldman tweeting out that USC might take a swing at Lincoln Riley. And I just instantly said, come on, get real. And ever since that Sunday in late November, it's been one plot twist after another and to be more precise, and for all the people in the comments here at the Voice of College Football, another instance in which I was loudly wrong and in which my uh, suspicions or my inclinations did not prove to be accurate. But like that's where we are. We're, we're seeing a, a new era in college sports. It's something we talked about around a month ago uh, after the Connerly snub uh, of USC when he went to Oregon, that the, the decisions which might seem logical on paper – don't necessarily manifest in reality. I think the pandemic has just created a new culture. I mean, it's given Americans in all walks of life, various professions, just license to go the road less traveled to do something that before the pandemic they might not have been alerted to, you know, might not have been aware of. But we're living in a new reality, I think, Mark, uh, where people, I think, are more li liberated to make, you know, their own choice. They're not following the larger script the culture holds out for them. And so it was very natural and understandable with Jordan Addison to kind of bring the conversation back to that particular point that, you know, when rumors surfaced of an NIL deal that, you know, well, OK, he, of course, he's not going to say no to Lincoln Riley. Of course, he's not going to say no to Los Angeles and the allure of playing with Caleb Williams and this this rising juggernaut, you know, back from the ashes, back from the rubble. You know, it just all made sense. It made for a great, convenient story. It also made for a very easy Lincoln Riley as villain story that here he is muscling in the portal and NIL and in what is basically now pay for play. And he's just going to muscle in smash and grab Jordan Addison from the clutches of Pittsburgh. 
again, the, the inclination was very easy, but you know, we talked about this on last week's regular broadcast. Here we are a week later, crickets, nothing, nothing's happened. And so you would think that, you know, if you were a conspiracy theorist and you had the inclination to think that, oh, okay, Jordan Addison wasn't going to announce right away after he entered the portal, but maybe just like a few days later after things died down, okay, then he'd announce for USC just to kind of get everybody off the scent kind of, you know, lowered the temperature in the room to make sure that the conspiracy theories died down. Then maybe like three or four days later, he'd announce, hasn't happened. So like that should lead us to think that he really hasn't made up his mind. That if he was plant trying to play the game and just, you know, was trying to let fears or recriminations from the Pittsburgh side die down, you know, he would have just waited a couple days and then gone ahead and done it. But if he hasn't made an announcement by now, uh, here we are on, on May 10, um, that should lead us to think that he really hasn't made his decision. Like, wh why would you delay it if you knew where you were going to go? And more specifically, from a USC standpoint, if, if uh, Jordan Addison and Caleb Williams really are that close. And Caleb Williams, by the way, he tweeted, uh, like I think it was Fox College Football uh, Twitter, uh, tweeted out, where do you think Jordan Addison should play? Caleb Williams, you know, tweeted USC in response to that over the weekend. I think it was on Saturday, might have been late Friday. But uh, like, so Caleb Williams is invested in this. You would think that if Jordan Addison really was signed, sealed, and delivered to USC, he would have made the commitment by now. Like, this is not something you should play out. Like, one would think that Jordan Addison would need to get on board, get in the fold, start, you know, having conversations with Lincoln Riley, he could do that if he committed to USC. Why do you um, protract this, this process? It just doesn't make sense. So all the, all the notions that this was a fait accompli, that it was already in the cards, it was just a matter of time, it was just a formality, those claims from the Pittsburgh side of the aisle, they don't stack up right now. They don't look very good. They don't look very accurate. So for all the ways in which I've been wrong about various aspects of the coaching carousel and the transfer portal carousel and Josh Connerly, you know, we're just seeing an era in which the thing that makes sense to us logically on the surface doesn't always happen. Actually, it isn't even happening most of the time. <laughs> no, it's not. Although, man, I got to say, if we take the Caleb Williams situation as an example, you know, we expected that to turn around in a heartbeat from Oklahoma to USC. And that was weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. We are working with a time crunch here, though, in regards to enrolling for class for the summer. I would think he would want to be enrolled for the summer. Yep. Uh, that's got to be inside a month at the most at this point. I would think something in that range. You would think, and again, you know, for just for people who didn't know or don't know that, you know, you had to enroll or you had to put your name in the portal by May 1st. And of course, there's like a 48 hour lag in terms of processing the papers. Um, so like the, the Jordan Addison's portal announcement wasn't official until uh, Monday, May or Tuesday, May 3rd. But at any rate, you had to put your name in the portal by May 1st to be able to be uh, eligible to play this fall. So you know that just reinforces the point that if you know you really value playing this year, okay. So now you need to make your decision, and now you need to get situated. Like yeah, the 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 clock is ticking, and so if you know where you want to play, I mean, wh like what's holding you back? What is the purpose of waiting? There doesn't seem to be any real purpose. So that again, that that reaffirms that Jordan Addison. Uh, you know, from from every reasonable vantage point, just hasn't made up his mind yet. So I'm not going to predict the future on this one. I'm going to just wait and see. I'm not going to risk an in, another incorrect prediction at this point. Well, at least you get out there, Matt. You go for it, you know, uh, <laughs> in terms of taking Sometimes. the shots. Sometimes. Got to. Well, the two schools that seem to be jumping out there in terms of what I'm seeing, uh, other than USC, would be Texas and Alabama. He worked service. out with Bryce Young, so that's a pretty big tell right there. Yeah, and Alabama, by their standards, are a bit thin at wide receiver. They haven't met that mark um, this past season that they did Jerry Judy, Henry Ruggs, 
on down the line that uh, four first round picks in two years. And then of course they had Mechie and Jameson Williams. They're both gone. And when they weren't in the lineup, it, uh, they obviously suffered last year and they're, they, they've got a loaded room, but it's, it's pretty unproven across the board. So of course, Addison would be huge for them. Uh, Texas with all their struggles from a wide receiver standpoint, they brought in Xavier worthy who was the one time Michigan commit and signee and he had a stellar first season for them and then a a Jai Hall who was a top 50 prospect that played one season in Alabama caught four or five passes last year he just transferred to Texas so they're stocking up as well Um, so it's an arms race in college football like no other time and just you know you mentioned Texas like imagine the the reaction at USC if uh, Jordan Addison chooses Steve Sarkeesian over Lincoln Riley. Yikes. I, I mean, I, I shudder at the thought. We'll see. But like, ooh, I I'm, I, I just shuddered uh, contemplating that. Yeah, man, Zemeck on the line. We will uh, on a regular basis here for our USC live show every uh, Tuesday, 1 Pacific time. And we hope to bring in some other voices. But if you track what we do with USC football here uh, on this channel, this channel wouldn't, uh, it existed before Matt, but I got to tell you, it's, uh, thriving with Matt here. Yeah. Uh, providing content for us and, every week. And we're, so this is a live show. So I see a question on our big board here at the what? voice of college football from Ed Rogers. Can USC win seven games this year? Now, you know, I'm very, I'm very tempted to call Ed a troll, but I want to value our listeners here on the voice of college football and say that, you know, in all, in all fairness, that there is a lot of skepticism about USC. Like uh, we, we wrote a story, a Trojans Wire, picking up a note from uh, uh, USA Today, did some preseason rankings, and UCLA is ranked ahead of USC. So like that's not, that's not some message board denizen. That's USA Today uh, analysis thinking that, you know, because UCLA has a much better or at least deeper offensive line than the Trojans do, you know, and UCLA's offensive line, like that's one of the Bruins' stronger units on their roster because of that. And also because you have Dorian Thompson Robinson coming back for one more year at quarterback, you know, that that offense is going to be good. And well, yeah, that offense probably will be good. But, you know, US, UCLA has had a Swiss cheese defense change at, at defensive coordinator. So, you know, still, you have Lincoln Riley now coaching at USC. Uh, against Chip Kelly. You know, Chip Kelly was able to beat Clay Helton, but uh, this is now very different. So, you know, USC, in my mind, is several notches better than UCLA. But if you, you know, if you are an analyst and there are some out there who think that UCLA is better than USC, then maybe you will conclude that it's a question as to whether USC is going to win seven games this year. But I would come back with this point for all the weaknesses on USC's roster, and we know that USC is very thin, especially on the defensive line, doesn't have as much depth as it would like on the offensive line either. But the defense is going to be a, a, especially a point of concern for all those weaknesses. You have Lincoln Riley coaching and calling offensive plays. You have Caleb Williams at quarterback, an elite Cadillac quarterback, just a top tier athlete, also a great leader in the locker room. And you have a down pack 12 and you have a schedule that that lines up really well for USC. Um, for for those who like haven't been paying too close attention to our discussions here at USC uh, and the voice of college football over the past few months, you know if you look at the layout of USC's schedule, the one really tough road game in the conference, other than Utah, you know th- that's the obvious big showdown in mid October in Salt Lake City. The one other really tricky road game is at Corvallis against Oregon State in late September. And if you know USC's history under Pete Carroll, you know that Corvallis was a stumbling block. That was a tough place to win, even for the best Pete Carroll team. So if USC can grab that win in Corvallis in late September, like there's no other landmine type game on the schedule. No other road game in which USC is likely to stumble. Now, I mean, it might lose at Utah, but like that's a featured game. That's going to be a probably an ABC primetime game. But if USC gets past the OSU game, it's going to be hard for this team to not go eight and one. 
Like if, if USC wins that OSU game, where, where are the other losses coming from in the Pac-12? USC doesn't play Oregon, doesn't play Washington you know, on, the, on the schedule rotation this year. And, you know, Arizona State has cratered in terms of recruiting, in terms of tra- transfer portal exits. So that's no longer a tough game. Um, you know, Washington State might be moderately difficult. You know, the Cougars did have a good finish to their season last year, but that game's at home. So, like, if that was in Pullman, that would have been a little bit thorny. But, like, just show me where the other losses are. They're not going to lose to Arizona. They're not going to lose to UCLA. They're not going to lose to Colorado. Just where, where you know, Stanford – that in week two, maybe that becomes a little bit problematic only because of the rust that USC has and the uncertainty of getting used to Lincoln Riley's system. But did you see Stanford last year? Did you see Stanford play last year? You know, th- th- that team hit rock bottom under David Shaw. And of course, he got a, a good recruiting class in, but you, know, you have a lot of young pups then that Shaw has to bring along. So playing USC in week two, that's not good for Stanford. It does not line up well for the Cardinal precisely because of how green they are throughout their roster. They have so many uh, uncertainties, so many unproven players. They would love to have played USC in November this year, but they get them in week two. So I don't see that Stanford game as being particularly threatening for USC. So Ed, maybe you were being sincere. Will USC win seven games? Maybe you were being a troll, but so I've laid it out, you know, directly straight, no, no BS. USC is going to find it hard to not win at least at the absolute floor, seven and two in the PAC 12. How, how is USC going to lose at least three conference games against that schedule? I mean, it's just, it's just not going to happen. Well, as Cheryl indicated in the chat, uh, Ed is one of our loyal viewers here at the Voice of College Football. So not necessarily a troll. I I think he likes to poke a little bit, though. Definitely a poke and a prod. (laughs) Yes. And that's okay. It's the offseason. And of course, this stuff is supposed to be fun. So, Ed, again, like I took your question seriously. I mentioned the possibility that you were just trying to have mischief. But I, I did take your question seriously. And I just explained why seven wins is not the floor. It's more like nine. Nine wins is the floor for this team in uh, in t- t- 2022. We always appreciate Matt Zemeck, Trojans Wire. Head on over to Trojans Wire. Catch Matt Works right there as we talk USC football. Matt has joined us here at the Voice of College Football. So we've had a recording time every Tuesday for months and months and months and months. And then you've seen the segments roll out. And we just figured, hey, let's do this live. Take questions from all of you and get this uh, ramped up. So we appreciate Matt committing to that. Uh, Here's a question for you, Matt, in regards to something that you've addressed many times in regards to, you know, what's the offensive bar from a uh, standpoint of being prolific, 35 points per game. And what did this defense have to do just enough to 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 make this kind of the season the Lincoln Riley's looking for? So 35 for the offense, 30 for the defense. Yeah, Oscar, great pair of questions. It's something we've talked about the last few months here at the Voice of College Football. And I think if USC hits those benchmarks. You know, average 36 uh, scored and allow 29, that's going to be a very successful season, most likely. And it could be that USC is going to score, you know, 75 points against Rice in week one, and that might skew the statistics. But on balance, on balance, if USC generally hits the benchmark of averaging mid to upper 30s in points and allowing very high 20s in points, it's probably going to work out well. You know, they might lose a couple one-point games, you know, which would be a real gut punch. But probably, probably it's going to be a very good season for USC. And I think as I, as I contemplate what will actually happen, I think the defense might check in allowing 31 or 32. Uh, but I think that the offense can, can uh, score about 38 and, and average about 38. So even then, you have about a plus seven differential on a per game basis and i think if usc gets there it's probably going to be good but i think if the uh season long differentials are closer to a field goal than a touchdown maybe like think 35 32 that you know that's probably where another loss gets into the equation and and what could be a 10 and 2 year becomes a 9 and 3 year so that's my overall sense so like you know i worry about the defense because there just aren't enough reinforcements right now along the defensive line. They just need so many more bodies. 
And you also have to consider the reality that Corey Foreman is behind schedule in his evolution. So, you know, he might become a great player midway through the season, but I don't think he's going to be a great player in week one. There's going to be an acclimation period. That's also why I keep going back to that Oregon State game. Also, the placement of that game on the calendar in week four, you might not see USC players at the stage in their evolutionary arcs where they're fully ready, fully prepared for what is a very good Oregon State offensive line. So that that game, to me, again, it stands out as the challenge that if US, USC can surmount that, the rest of the season lines up well. Players are going to develop. They're going to get better in October and November. So, Oscar, great question, and I think that the Oregon State game might you know, be the game that really shapes those statistics uh, more than any other this season like to let everyone know that uh, we're sim simulcasting on the main channel, but we're also on the USC channel. Going forward, we'll just be on the USC channel, and um, the other team channels have been uh, very well in regards to uh, these live streams, but just want to let everyone know that we'll be on the USC channel uh, exclusively going forward. So Willie, uh, he's another regular here. So Willie, we need to correct a few things here. Uh, Caleb Williams threw 21 touchdown passes. So you're, you're close there. 21 touchdowns, four picks, which is one of the best ratios in the country last year. Plus he's a dynamic runner, Willie. Um, also he was not benched for Spencer Radler. Spencer Radler was benched for Caleb Williams who saved, uh, Oklahoma and Lincoln Riley's hide against Texas down by three touchdowns at halftime of that game, 28 to seven threw five touchdown passes and, and won that game going away, kept the job the rest of the season. So it was Williams replacing Radler. And uh, Willie, you, you're predicting that USC is going to lose three games. Well, let me tell you, if uh, USC uh, goes uh, 11 and two and wins the Pac-12 and then that third loss comes in the bowl game, hey, I'll sign up for that. That, that would be a successful season at USC, winning the Pac-12 and then losing game three in the bowl. So that's my that's my workaround. Now, if you're predicting USC is going to go nine and three in the 12 game season, yeah, that would be a little bit disappointing uh, for the Trojans. And, and again, it's going to come down to their their defensive front because you know if USC gets gashed on a regular basis, that means other teams are controlling the ball, they're controlling the clock. Caleb Williams is not getting as many plays and possessions per game. That's going to be the most direct path to beating USC this season. So U USC needs to beef up on the defensive line. So like if USC doesn't make a few splashes in the transfer portal along its defensive line, yeah, that's going to that's gonna keep a lot of three and four loss predictions flowing in from various corners of the country. Matt, the real MVP is bringing up something that um, a lot of people take one side of this argument in regards to, okay, does the easy schedule pave the way for a college football playoff or the, you know, the inferior conference, or is it being in the better conference where the committee is going to look at an extra loss as not as being credible because of the toughness and difficulty of the schedule. So what do you think about USC's path in regards to how legitimate the schedule is going to be perceived by the committee? Well, the first thing you have to look at in the PAC 12 conference is that the Pac-12 has struggled to create 12-1 and or 13-0 and champions. So often you get like a one-loss Oregon or a one-loss Utah getting into late November and they stub their toe, right? And so they get that second loss and they're, they're eliminated from playoff discussion. So my starting point, Dereal MVP, is let's just get a 12-1 and team, all right? Because we haven't had that. You know, so Washington in 2016 – was a 12 and one team and got in. So like, let's just get there and then test that theory about whether a 12 and one team will get in. Now, in terms of diving in a little deeper on that, it obviously goes to what are the other teams doing? Like, do you have a two loss Georgia? You know, does Georgia pick up somehow pick up two losses at some point in the season while you have SEC champion Alabama unbeaten, you know, or can Georgia go, 12 and one, you know, that, so that is an obvious tension point. And then Ohio state, Ohio state, you know, at 12 and one probably is in very good shape for a playoff berth, but losing twice, you know, that would all, that would also change the conversation. Uh, you know, is Notre, Notre Dame now, well, Notre Dame, you have Notre Dame and USC playing in late November. So in that case, 
Um, you know, if USC has a win over Notre Dame in late November, Notre Dame is really good. Like, let's say that's a an all top 10 matchup on Thanksgiving weekend and USC wins it. That's going to be a big poker chip for Lincoln Riley and the Trojans. And of course, we saw that Cincinnati by beating Notre Dame head to head like that gave Cincinnati the unique leverage to get into the playoff. If Cincinnati had beaten another top 10 team, not Notre Dame. You know, the Irish might have gotten in, but because Cincinnati had that specific head to head advantage, it was impossible for the committee, read ESPN, uh, to pull the strings uh, and get Notre Dame in. Cincinnati had that trump card and it was an airtight seal against the Irish. So USC could have that same airtight seal in a possible debate for the fourth uh, playoff seed. So there are a lot of particularities that attach to this particular season that could go in USC's favor. But again, I need to kind of broaden uh, the picture again on this particular debate. The Pac-12 has not produced many 12-1 and conference champions. That's why it's working on a six-year college football playoff drought. Everyone in the Pac-12, everyone who covers football in the Pac-12, everyone who wants to see the Pac-12 succeed at the highest level in college football, George Klyavkov on down, they know – we just need to get a 12 and one conference champion again, because that's been the dry spell, which is uh, what, what's caused this massive playoff uh, zero uh, since 2016. And unfortunately for the PAC 12, the last time a team did reach uh, the playoff from the PAC 12 was 2016. And most people believe that not to even be the best team in the PAC 12 at that point, uh, Washington played basically a, nondescript i think rutgers was their big non-conference game went through the pac-12 beat a pretty mediocre colorado team that was just you know had a spike of a year uh in the pac-12 championship game and usc beat them by two touchdowns and was red hot by the end of the year of course with sam darnold won the rose bowl and was a team that everybody wanted to see in terms of fans wanted to see in the playoff that year nobody wanted to see uh, usc as an opponent on the field though let me interject, you know, so one thing we covered here at uh, Trojans Wire over the past week, which is germane to this particular conversation, our friend John Wilner uh, of the Wilner Hotline at the San Jose Mercury News. And for those uh, watching us here on the Voice of College Football who don't follow the Pac-12 very closely on a day in, day out basis, you want to follow John Wilner. Uh, ha has his finger on the pulse of the conference, one of the best reporters and insiders covering all of Pac-12 athletics. So he came out with a column last week saying that he expects uh, a change in the Pac-12 championship games format as early as next year, as early as 2023, in which the Pac-12 is going to scrap the two-division format and go to the Big 12 model of the top two teams in the conference. So like that has definite implications, Mark, for what you just pointed out that you want to get your two best teams in. You want to have the elites. You want to have the hot teams playing at the end of the season so that you don't have, you know, a, a, a three loss Colorado or, or some other team uh, in that championship game. It's also, of course, the dynamic that the ACC has had with Clemson beating a four or five loss tomato can in Charlotte. Most years, obviously you didn't have that last year, but you know, most, most years, that's been the case. So the Pac-12 is probably going to get away from the divisional format, and it's a great move because you do want the two best teams in your conference. You don't want that artificial barrier created by division. So, and it's and it's interesting that USC could really use that new format this year because USC and Utah, in my mind at least, are clearly the two best teams in the conference. Some will say Oregon is in the mix. But if you do accept the idea that USC and Utah are one and two, regardless of order, then a divisionless Pac-12 title game format would really help the Trojans. But because that format's not going to be in place this year, if USC loses that game in Salt Lake City, you know, the Trojans might get boxed out of the Pac-12 title game. And it's going to be Oregon, even though uh, the, the Trojans might be better than the Ducks this season. This is our first edition, folks, USC Live right here at the Voice of College Football. And um, we couldn't do it without Matt Zemek from Trojans Wire, so we appreciate him. We record every week. Now we're going to go live, and so you can count on us here every Tuesday. And again, uh, we're looking for sponsorship. Also, um, hit the like button and uh, let people know that we're here. 
every Tuesday as well. Share that link out on social media. Uh, Jermaine Lowell is the 24th rated strong side defensive end in the country, roughly top 500 player, had committed to Arizona State. I know you had mentioned to me, Matt, before we jumped on, that there were some rumblings concerning some players from Arizona State. Of course, uh, Eric Gentry was a player that uh, USC has already um, received uh, via transfer portal from Arizona State and and Utah. And uh, was, was he one of them? Do you have any insight into Jermaine Lowell? Yeah, so Paul references uh, the question, you know, is he not coming to USC due to academic reasons? So I can tell you, Paul, that Antonio Morales, the fine USC beat writer at The Athletic, very good, very respected among the USC community, among USC fans. Yeah, he has a source telling him that USC is out of the running. Now, I haven't seen that picked up by other outlets and other reporters, but Antonio Morales has definitely said that USC is not in the hunt for Jermaine Lowell uh, because of because of academic particularities. So that, that there there is something to that story. Just here in the last 24 hours, Matt, of course, uh, quarterback Dylan Rayola, uh, the number one rated quarterback in the country, according to depending on your service, number three in the composite out of Arizona. He has committed to Ohio State 2024, that commitment. Shoot, that's that's a long ways away to to, to wrap up a commitment there. So there could be some tug of war uh, going on between now and uh, signing day. But um, how close is USC to Rayola? Is he one of their um, targets? Is is he in the running there at USC? I mean, he was definitely on the radar, but I don't think USC fans are going to lose a whole lot of sleep on this because you have Malachi Nelson, you know, waiting in the wings as the successor to Caleb Williams. So, like, you know, <laughs> I got 99 problems. <laughs> it, you know, if we attach that to USC, U USC has 99 problems. Quarterback ain't one. Yes, for sure. For sure. You know, we we are seeing, um, and you've you've partially answered this question with some of your wins projections about you know sizing up the schedule versus USC talent, plus a few deficiencies held over from the twenty one season, i.e. the defense and as a whole. And and certainly check out the videos that we posted with Matt. We ran through every position unit, offense and defense, um, as uh, they look coming out of uh, spring practice here. Where would you rank this team, you know, regardless of schedule, uh, taking into account these huge gains in talent where we're looking at the num number one transfer portal team in the nation with 15 commits and there are 15 quality commits, but they had a lowly rated recruiting class, not because of the talent of the team, but they only had eight commits. You throw it all together. They're number nine in the composite in terms of rankings for 2022. Um, you know, where, where do you think this team stacks up nationally among the top 25 teams or so? Yeah. So, you know, taking USC out of the Pac-12, which, you know, again, has been a, a down conference in recent years. And that's why that's why I'm high on USC in terms of its schedule. But if you take that schedule and the Pac-12 specific piece out of the puzzle, Mark, I, I, I'd say that USC is probably top 15. I'd say that's about right for how this program stacks up on a national level because the established powers, especially in the SEC and Big Ten, like, like they have the machine rolling. They know exactly what they're about. They know exactly what they need to do. Uh, and they're, they're a notch better, I think, than USC is. I mean, that that's where USC's depth or lack thereof, more precisely, would, would put the Trojans at a real disadvantage compared to the Ryan Days and Kirby Smarts and Nick Sabins, uh, you know, who have, you know, that established pipeline who are able to just regularly reload. Like Lincoln Riley isn't really reloading. He's trying to just build something from scratch, build it from the transfer portal. That's where Clay Helton's damage to the program would show up. So I'm, I'm reluctant to say USC is a top 10 program, but I think top 15 is about right. And I do put USC at the top of the Pac-12 because again, and, and this is not a slight against Utah. It's just a reflection of the competition that you go against. That Utah crushed Oregon twice last year because Oregon had was significantly flawed at quarterback and other key positions. 
We've talked a lot here in the Voice of College Football about Pac-12 Pac quarterback play being really bad in 2021. And so USC getting the instant upgrade with Caleb Williams and you marry him with Lincoln Ryland's, Lincoln Riley's savvy as a play caller. And that is just such a massive instant upgrade in quality that it's going to lift USC above all the other programs in the Pac-12 conference nationally, you know, but the superpowers in the various other conferences with the possible exception of Clemson, uh, USC is definitely below those programs. And, and you just while we're on that subject, I mean, there are a few more interesting comparisons than USC and Clemson because uh, you, you have Clemson with like the infrastructure and the depth uh, that USC lacks. But then USC has the quarterback play that Clemson lacks. And it's going to be a really big point of intrigue this year if Dabo can solve the yips problem for DJ Uyangalale. And so like when you put USC and Clemson together, it's like the yin and the yang. Mm -hmm. USC has what Clemson lacks. Clemson has what USC lacks, but they both aren't complete teams because they both have that one glaring deficiency. Imagine a team with all the depth of Clemson up front and Caleb Williams. Imagine, you know, USC, uh, you know, on, on the other side of the divide, uh, it, it's just really fascinating to put those two programs together if we're, if we're into national comparisons uh, for college football this coming season. Yeah, Clemson had a top three or four defense in the country last year, and unlike Georgia, they didn't get uh, ripped to shreds, and, and I don't even expect Georgia's uh, play on defense to, to suffer much, and that's ridiculous to think about losing the kind of talent that they did. But Clemson retained their talent on defense, but can that – just a remarkable defense lift and offense where DJ was marginal at best to be kind. The offensive he was, line. He was Rick was. and Keel. He was Chuck <laughs> Knobloch. That's Could, it. Just couldn't yes. throw the ball. Hey, this is a really interesting question here from Tim Prangley. Yep. So USC playing Utah. What's the benefit of doing it twice? How did it work out for Alabama this past season? A reference to, you know, no divisions. Uh, in the conference championship game and, and they're therefore having rematches between teams that would normally play each other in the regular season. Well, let me address the, how did it work out for Alabama? Alabama would be national champion if Jameson Williams didn't get hurt against Georgia and Alabama won the sec championship and Alabama was playing in the national championship game. That that's pretty good in my book. And if, if you were to tell a USC fan right now, that will be in the national championship game. Uh, you know, if, if that's what, if that's the cost of, of playing Utah twice, Hey, I, I, we'll take it. We'll sign on the dotted line. If you have a contract offer for us. Uh, so uh, how did it work out for Alabama? Not too badly. And, and really it was injuries more than Georgia, uh, which decided that game. I mean, not that Georgia didn't earn it, not that Stetson Bennett didn't earn it, not that the Bulldogs didn't deserve it for all their hard work and how they took control of that game in the second half. But, you know, Alabama was in control of that game in the first 15, 20 minutes. And, you know, forces beyond the tide's control certainly shifted the tide. That doesn't take anything away from Georgia. But, like, Alabama was not uh, dominated from start to finish. Let's just put it that way in the title game. Alabama had its chances, had its opportunities so if that's like the sticking point in terms of uh, playing a conference opponent twice in the regular season, hey, USC fans certainly should not be worried about that. If, 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 uh, if losing in the national title game becomes a recurring thing at USC, uh, like, you know, the 2006 Rose Bowl was a traumatic experience for USC fans. There's no question about it. It still stings 16 years later. But if that becomes the new normal, Hey, we'll sign up for that. Like we, we can take that. Like we've lived through Clay Helton yeah. for seven years. We with that. We lived through Lane this. Kiffin. Oh, we lived God. through Sark. We lived through seven lost Sark, who's now at Texas. Um, we'll, we'll take being number two in the country on an annual basis. Uh, yeah, we'll accept that. Yeah. Deal with that issue when it becomes an issue. If it That's becomes a first an issue. world problem, we, we, we are up for that here at USC. Believe me.
you know, my take on the whole Georgia Alabama situation without the two receivers, Mechie and then Williams, is that you, you can't discredit Georgia. They won the national championship fair and square. It wasn't like there was some blown call at the end of the game or anything like that. Is it reasonable for an Alabama fan to say, hey, I think we would have won the national championship? We had John Mechie and Jamison Williams. Absolutely. I have no issue with an Alabama fan saying that. I, I do have an issue with I've had Alabama fans come on and say, you know, that it's a foregone conclusion. It would have happened. Well, yeah, we, we don't please. know. We yeah. don't know. I have no issue with you saying you believe that it would have happened, yeah, but of course. you can't say give us a national championship because we would have won it. You of know, course. injuries are part Absolutely. of the sport. Injuries are part of the sport. We're seeing this in the NBA with John Moran against the Golden State Warriors. Like, you know, we know it's a big influencer of the outcome, but that doesn't mean the other team doesn't deserve it. I mean, it's, it's that simple. Like we, I hope we know how to talk about injuries in sports, at least at that fundamental level. You know, Tim, uh, yeah, I think the the end result is pretty much the same, but he's talking about a regular season game and then a Pac-12 championship game. How does that serve USC if they've got to run into Utah twice? Well, one way it serves them is just to get them into the championship game if they are the two seed in the conference and also the two seed in their division, they're out. Yeah. So, so Tim, okay. So tackling it from that vantage point, I mean, you know, Georgia and Alabama played twice last year, once in the regular season, once in the, uh, I mean, once in the SEC championship game and then once in the national championship game, they didn't play in the, the 12 game regular season. Uh, that was, that was a year. That was the year before they met in Tuscaloosa in the regular season, but not last year. So that's why I, I responded to your question uh, with, with a postseason scenario, but to so to address your point, okay, you play in the the normal twelve game regular season, and then as the second meeting in the conference championship game, let's just address that uh, through a 2022 lens. So let's say USC loses the regular season game in Salt Lake City. Well, if you have a, a divisionless format. Uh, USC can still make the title game and then you get the revenge opportunity against Utah. And usually, you know, getting the second bite at the apple, the second uh, chance uh, to beat a specific opponent, that second time is usually going to go better than the first time. And, you know, we saw this with Georgia and Alabama last year, even though they didn't meet in the actual regular season. Um, so like USC would welcome the chance uh, to get revenge if it loses in Salt Lake City in mid-October. But then let's flip the scenario. Let's say USC wins in Salt Lake City and then has to play Utah again in the conference championship game. Well, what does that mean? It means if USC beats Utah a second time, now not, it's not going to be easy, but you're playing Utah. You're not playing, let's say, a four-loss Oregon team. You're not playing uh, a, a four-loss Washington team. You're playing potentially... 11 and one Utah with Utah's only loss being to USC. So if you beat Utah a second time, what does that mean? It means you get playoff leverage. If, if it's a close debate, if it's a close call. So the benefit of sweeping Utah playoff leverage, the benefit of getting a second chance at Utah after losing in the regular season, if you're going to map out that particular Avenue, uh, then you get a better chance of getting, winning that revenge match and getting the PAC 12 championship and if you don't make the playoff, you make the Rose Bowl, which, you know, USC has made just one Rose Bowl uh, in the past 13 years. Hey, if USC makes the Rose Bowl this year, if you're, if you're, if you're to tell me, hey, Matt, USC is going to be in the Rose Bowl. Do you take that deal no matter what else is going on? Yes. We've been away for so long. <laughs> this, this has no longer been the USC standard since Pete Carroll left. Yes. We'll take the Rose Bowl happily, gleefully. And then we can build to 2023 and 2024. A Rose Bowl would certainly lift recruiting. It would lift all the things that Lincoln Riley is trying to restore here at USC. Then in 2023, 2024, you get more depth. You get better, even better recruiting than what we've already had, which has been substantial. And then you're at a, a level where you can win national championships. So, uh, Tim, really, I, I think the benefits completely outweigh the negatives and the possible uh, pitfalls of this uh, hypothetical. I Your disagreement so. is noted for the record. I, I, I think the scenarios change every year and the situation for all teams and, and for all the scenarios that anybody can draw to say, Hey, I want 
the the conference championship to change this way, or I want the playoff to change that way. And the only thing that they're contemplating and thinking is such and such happened last year and I didn't like it. Therefore we need to change it just based on that scenario. That is not uh, being uh, for forward thinking and taking all variables into account. It's one of the great trap doors in college football argumentation and debate because one year, you know, you're the, you're the one loss conference champion. And next year, you know, the other team is, and you have the two losses, but the better strength of schedule, you know, that's like the LSU Oregon debate from, uh, from, from about a decade ago, you know, or, or also Stanford, Oregon and Stanford had some debates as well along those lines yeah so what happens one year next year it boomerangs back and you're on the other side of the fence and you're just you're just left there arguing the other position that you know 12 months earlier you were defending but like, that goes nowhere you have to deal with broader architectures and more consistent principles in college football argumentation yes could um Utah and USC tie for the division championship and Utah win head to head because they are playing at Salt Lake City, correct, this year? Yes, yes, they are. It's in Salt Lake City. So could USC be left out because of that? Absolutely. And then you would want as a USC fan for that to, to, to be structured as one conference and not two divisions. So you get into the championship. Can it be another year in which USC is – the best team in the conference and Utah is the second best team in the conference and USC would have to beat them twice. And that would be a difficult assignment versus playing, you know, there are all sorts of structures in which we see the third best team in a conference be decidedly worse than the second best team. Sure. It, it can work both ways. <laughs> Absolutely. Yep. Uncle Rico, this is a very interesting point. So Utah went toe to toe of the best offense in the country last year. They will handle USC this year. Well, first off, it's in Salt Lake City, probably going to be a night game. It's very hard to win uh, in uh, Echoes Rice Stadium at night. So, hey, I mean, Utah is probably going to be like a field goal favorite entering that game. And it certainly would not be a surprise if Utah beats USC. But I will make the point, as I've made before, that Utah was able to crush a, a, an opponent with Anthony Brown at quarterback. We're talking about Oregon. And Caleb Williams is a totally different league of quality and brilliance uh, for a defense compared to Anthony Brown. And I just think that that level of elevation in talent is so stratospheric that that's going to give USC a real chance uh, against Utah. And you know, nothing against Cam Rising. Like, he was terrific. And, of course, you know, he relieved Charlie Brewer, stepped right in, instantly transformed that offense. Like, Utah was a juggernaut on offense uh, in the latter half of the Pac-12 season. So that that is certainly an offense which could tear USC's defense to shreds. Uh, but if it's a pure firefight, you know, if it's, a, if it's a computer game, if it's like one of those Baker Mayfield, Patrick Mahomes, Big 12-style shootouts, where we get into the fifties, like I like Caleb Williams chances against cam rising. And that's not a knock on cam, cam rising. It just is a testament to my belief that Caleb Williams has the higher ceiling. Now, maybe, maybe cam rising has the higher floor, but the higher ceiling, Caleb Williams is the highest ceiling quarterback in the PAC 12. So that that's the argument for USC, but Utah has a more established veteran team, Defending Pac-12 champion, going to be at home. Like that's that is clearly the toughest Pac-12 game on USC schedule. And if Notre Dame trips up, it's the toughest game on USC schedule overall this coming season. <laughs> I mean, I'm amused by this comment by Jet Mac. USC is going to be 12 and one, and they're going to send them to the I don't know the Holiday Bowl. That's not even a mid tier, but they're going to I don't know relegate them to the. Um, where they're going to relegate them to Memphis or somewhere to play a bowl game, I guess. I mean, if, if we're a one loss program this year, Hey, we'll take that. And if that, if that means being craptastic, uh, well, Hey, if we're the most craptastic one loss program in the country, sign me up. I'll, I will gladly accept that. If you want to attach that label to it. Thank you, uncle Rico. I couldn't think of a, you know, I I've been, not thinking of bowl games for a few months. I couldn't think of a third rate type of bowl game. There you go. The Duke's Mayo bowl, even though I don't think the, uh, 
The Jimmy Kimmel yeah. LA Bowl, I think, would be under yes. the Pac-12 contractual go, umbrella of obligations. Don't work yeah. out for the Duke's yeah. Mayo Bowl, but uh, yeah. point well taken, Uncle Rico. All right, good stuff. Appreciate everybody being here for our USC live show. We're going to be here every Tuesday, and we've got Matt to thank in terms of uh, providing us with the analysis, and I'll be here as well, and we'll uh, bring some other voices in from time to time, but. Uh, Matt has uh, contributed so much to us in uh, building this USC channel and please join his work. Uh, we'll get his post up here uh, on the banner, Matt Zemeck at uh, Trojans Wire. And please subscribe to our USC channel if you're going to take in the content um, because YouTube doesn't like it if you just subscribe to the channel to be nice to me and then you don't like the content. They want uh, active subscribers so please do that uh, if you're a USC fan or, hey, just a college football fan that want to keep up with the big brands, you know, check out our, our content there. And again, Trojans Wire with Matt. So it's not enough to center the ball for that final field goal. You have to get the laces out. You know, you have to go through all the fundamentals and you have to make sure the kicker is comfortable with all the situation. So it's not just a one-step process. It's a multi-step process here at the Voice of College Football. Absolutely right. Paul, we appreciate you being here as a USC fan. Uh, and as you can tell, Matt, uh, this is probably a bit different than some of your other experiences with your podcast and so forth, where um, it's all USC. We, we range all over the place from college football fan bases. Hey, you know, so for, for those who don't know me, like I joined college football news uh, back in the day with Pete Futak, Rich Sermonello in uh, 2001. So like I've been covering college football nationally for about 20 years and uh, love the sport, have a, a, a good awareness of what's going on across the nation. Like I don't have, I don't know like everything about every program, but I know a lot about every program. And I know something about every program and it's really been great to dive a little deeper at USC and Trojans wire and get into that mode of, you know, understanding one program uh, in greater depth and detail. I want to mention one thing about our coverage at Trojans wire uh, on Memorial Day weekend and through the, through June and July, the, 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 the kind of the quiet period before August camp, we have an extended podcast series where we're going to we're going to do a deep dive into Lincoln Riley uh, from an Oklahoma expert who's really studied him closely at OU. And we're just going to get a lot of insights, quotes, analysis, history, context, the controversies, uh, you know, the, the, the his play calling film room. Just we're gonna we have an extensive series laid out that we're gonna launch around Memorial Day weekend. So that's what you're gonna want to follow at Trojans Wire in June and July. So I just wanted to get that across, kind of just whet the appetite uh, for people who are interested in learning more about Trojans Wire and about Lincoln Riley. You know, this is our off season to really educate not just the fan base but ourselves as we cover USC football as the Lincoln Riley era begins at USC. And I certainly think with this Jordan Addison situation, it's been easy for the college football fan. I'm not talking about the Pitt specific fan or yes. the USC fan, but the college football fan to villainize Lincoln Riley to say, yes, we didn't like how he left Oklahoma and he did them wrong. And now he's doing this wrong too. And I don't know. I, I, I don't want to, I'm, I'm not going to take sides in it because we don't know all the facts and everything involved, but uh, we, we know that, um, that coaches are pursuing players uh, and that's going on all across the nation. Yeah. And you know what, to talk, just to talk about that for a moment, cause I think it's worth, it's worth discussing. Um, you know, in terms of Lincoln Riley's own behavior, here's my one thing, my one basic problem with Lincoln Riley, but this doesn't like make him unique among coaches. I think that what the problem with Lincoln Riley is a problem shared by most other coaches in the sport. It's that when something goes well, you know, they, 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 then everything's great. But when something goes badly for them, then they talk about the evils of the system and, and all the flaws and all the problems. You know, hey, you're you're making millions of dollars. I'm talking not just about Lincoln Ryan. I'm talking about any high profile coach, football or basketball. You are getting paid millions of dollars to do something that you love, to do something that you're really good at. You know, we, we know it's a flawed and broken system, but just just minimize the belly aching and the moaning and about how this is like tearing apart the fabric of society or it's destroying college sports as we know it, please, please, as though there wasn't, you know, illicit or unethical activity 50, 60 years ago. I mean, Hey, 
we, at USC, we know that, you know, John Wooden over at UCLA, he had Sam Gilbert, not, not to throw too much shade on the rival Bruins, but of course that's an obvious representative example to use. Let's just not pretend that it was this oasis of purity and virtue and honor 50, 60 years ago. And that only, only now, only now is this a real problem. And it's, it's detracting from our enjoyment of the sport. Hey, you like college football. You come here to the voice of college football to discuss the sport in early May. You're obviously a diehard fan. You're not going to stop watching college football because of this NIL stuff. Be honest with yourself. And so I, I ask that I ask that of Lincoln Riley and other coaches, Pat Narduzzi, the whole lot that, you know, just, you know, it's a it's a bad system and that certainly needs to be reformed. But let's not make too much of an issue about it because the transfer portal and these other ways to acquire players these days, these are these are paying coaches salaries. These are leading to wins on the field with just to just to consider basketball for a very brief second. Remy Martin was a transfer from Arizona State. Without him, Kansas and Bill Self don't win the national title. So Bill Self, please don't knock the portal when it's helping you win a second national championship. That's that's the thing that that drives me nuts. But to kind of circle back to the Lincoln Riley as villain thing, like he didn't start these problems. He's not the the ultimate embodiment of these problems. This is something that's pervasive to the sport. You know, everyone's dealing with it. The problems with, you know, recruiting through the, t the transfer portal and tampering, you know, a coach, you know, will just kind of wink, wink, nudge, nudge, you know, get a tell a player, you know, to recruit another player like that's been going on for a long time. So to to say that this is a unique Lincoln Riley problem, get out of here. I don't want to hear that. All right. Like he is not like the the poster child uh, for what's wrong. Uh, you know, he, you can say that he's working the gray areas. Fine. So does John Calipari at Kentucky. So do all the various coaches uh, in college football and basketball at the top tier of the sport. Let's not make this into a one person problem. This is an NCAA problem. And that's the thing that everybody should be able to agree on. Well, we're going to have future weeks and shows to dive into this further, of course. And there's going to be more to, to specifically deal with as this rolls out. But I'll, I'll, I'll bring up two issues that I think the general fan has, and I think one's legit and one's not, at least from my perspective. One is that there's something uh, unique to college athletics and college football, since we focus on that, that detach it from professional, and that's that your guy, your players, will always be your players. When we watch Monday Night Football, when we watch an NFL game, and those players are are ripping off their school and announcing the starting lineup, there's a sense of pride for the college football fan that that Rodney Pete always played at USC, never played anywhere else. And Todd Marinova, USC, you know, name your player. There, it was very rare that a player, a significant player, played at multiple schools in the past. So you could always take that player and say he was always a Buckeye, always a Trojan, always a Longhorn. And, and that's that's – going away it's going to be we're not going to see many of those players 10 years from now watching nfl games um the the other part of that and so i think that's a legit um you know that that was a there there was a regardless of what was going on behind the scenes there was a purity to that in terms of loyalty um the the one thing that's ironic is that it seems like there was a groundswell of support for nil in regards to well these kids should be making money. You know, their, their blood, sweat and tears are going into uh, the workouts and everything that they have to do to play the games and risking injury. And the, the, the big wigs and the suits are making all the money they need. They need a portion of this. Well, now that they're getting uh, that opportunity, people are against it. I think people are uncomfortable once the dollar amount becomes a cert. We always tend to in America, I believe, think that everyone at our level or below they're making reasonable amounts of money. But when somebody makes considerably more than us, that to us, well, that's a lot of money. You know, if you're making $50,000, a hundred thousands is a lot of money. But if you're making a hundred thousand, that's not a lot of money. 200,000 is a lot of money and on and on and on. And really that's not the American way. And that's not the marketplace. The marketplace is you make what you make based on supply and demand. 
Well, you know, not not to get into religion specifically, Mark, but, you know, we know the parable of the laborers in the vineyard, right, where the, the, <laughs> the, the vineyard owner gave these workers a, a specific wage early in the day, and it was a good wage, it was a fair wage, you know, paid them well, but then, oh, late in the afternoon, he needed some more laborers to finish the day of work before sunset, so they got a really good wage, but for less, less fewer hours spent, but hey, you got your good deal. You know, so what if someone else gets what might be a comparatively better deal? You were offered a deal. You liked it. You thought it was fair. You thought you were treated well. So if someone else gets paid even uh, more money, at least in terms of a per hour rate later in the day, why should that be your concern? And so that, like that's that's the real point here is that, you know, are, are people being treated more fairly? That's what we should be focused on getting into these unique one time or one player comparisons you know that is the the road to dissatisfaction uh but it, but like if, if we think we get a good deal at 10 a.m and someone else gets a, an even better deal at 3 p.m should that change the, the 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 feeling that we got a really good deal at, at 10 a.m it shouldn't yeah i think uh, most of us can can relate to the workplace situation where certain people are certainly perfectly fine with their salary or their bonus until they find out what somebody else is making or what somebody else's bonus was. <laughs> there you no go. No doubt. No doubt. USC Trojans live here uh, every Tuesday, four Eastern, one Pacific. Matt Zemick makes it all happen. Check out his work at Trojans Wire. Uh, Matt, we appreciate this. And uh, again, everyone, make it on back next week. Bring some folks with you. And uh, let's make this work. We would like to sustain this. So uh, please do all those things that uh, we count on. Hit the like button, share the videos, tell people that we're here and uh, here with the voice of college football. Matt, we appreciate it. It was great. And uh, hope to see you next week as always. Absolutely. So like when you after when you call the timeout, call two plays in the huddle, not just one. You got to subscribe and like take both steps, not just one. Absolutely. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate you. it. You bet.